which you can buy. But you know, what I will tell you today are mostly coming from this book. And more importantly, it was written to help in developing quality researchers, the topic assigned to me today. So quality researchers and quality research go hand in hand. These are not born, more so these are not bought. They are the product of a long and arduous, zealous struggle and constant practice. Let me tell you my journey as a researcher, as early as the 70s, so I might be revealing my age. <laughs> Universities have been requiring undergraduates to prepare a thesis as a final requirement for graduation. And I have a disclosure to make. I was a political detainee during the first quarter storm. I was a graduating student then, and I only needed a final research paper or a thesis to earn my bachelor's degree from the University of the Philippines. But how could I conduct research? I was a detainee at Camp Krame. But a characteristic of a good researcher is that she always finds ways, and I did. I asked my classmates who would visit me regularly to the camp to bring me books, journals, magazines, newspapers, and other documents related to my thesis. I read a lot inside my cell, and I wrote my thesis in longhand. You know, the computers were not then popular. For each chapter that I finished, I sent to my friends for typing. It was very difficult, but I managed to complete my thesis while inside the company of first quarter storm activists. Was I a good researcher then? Did I do quality research? Nah, the big, it's a big, big no. I was not doing good research. Why? What I did was what we call table research, all based on secondary data. If at all, I did a review of literature. So my first point, a good research always seeks for primary data or original information coming from first-hand experience. And how do we get primary data? We go directly to the source and not rely on second-hand information. Go to those with novel stories to tell. Get information from those who have vantage points. Seek for those who can say a lot about the phenomenon you are investigating. Listen to the grassroots, victims and their survivors, beneficiaries, leaders, movers, implementers, planners, even villains and perpetrators of crimes. Hear those who were right where the action is. Go to the site where the event happened. Talk to a variety of informants. Get all the angles. Obtain all new fantastic points of view. Over, sideways, and under. Ika nga ng isang song. A whole new world to pursue new horizons. In research, we call this triangulation. A system of combining methods, theories, sources, disciplines, and even time. I always told my students I do not like single method research. I will not accept a research work coming just from one set of respondents or informants. I want multidisciplinary research. My second point, when doing field work, do not act like research tourists. What do I mean by this? They use convenient sampling when there is a plethora of sampling methods that they can use. Either they are lazy or do not know any better. For instance, researchers could be picky and choose only research locale that are nearby or have good transportation facilities. Yes, they may go to the towns or barangays but stay in the city or town where the primary informants are in the hinterlands or in the bootlock. What they do is to invite these informants to come down to the lowland and then they conduct the interview there. What will they miss in this case? 
the natural setting. That is also an important context to observe in generating data. Whatever conditions your informants have the product are the products of their environment or the place where they live. Therefore, the natural setting of your subjects is very important. Research tourists, I hope you are not like that. <laughs> Research tourists do not employ appropriate sampling methods and at times gender blind. They mostly talk to men and neglect the experiences of women. How can you not talk to women? They own half the skies, they own half of the world, and their insights and ideas are as bright as the men, maybe even brighter. Another one, research tourists talk only to officers or the heads of organizations who can accommodate them well and then entertain them with nice lunch and dinner and interesting tokens. What about an ordinary community member or a commoner? The hoi puloi or a regular man or a woman on the street, he or she too has a story to tell. The elitism in some researchers shows that they dread going to the slums or the mountains where there is inconvenience and facilities are substandard. You know, when I was a young researcher, there was a research on poverty that my research boss wanted me to do. At that time, the rainy season was up, and she told me to wait for a good weather. And I asked her, but mom, this should be a good time to visit because it is when the weather is bad that signs of poverty are prevalent. So you see mosquitoes, dengue, and other sickness, flooded crops, poor drainage, weak bridges, and expensive food. These are the indicators of poverty, which you will not find if you're looking for good weather and a good place. So this will be described not only by the informants, but you can see it from your naked eye what poverty is. My second journey to becoming a researcher was when I got employed in a non-government organization as a research officer. My task was to conduct interviews and investigate on those who will qualify for a social housing program. Sure, I went to the field, visited their natural setting. I got information straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I went to the sites to observe. I conducted collateral interviews, checking on the character of the applicant by interviewing neighbors, their bosses, friends, and even parish priests. I just went on and on. Was I doing good research? Maybe a little bit but not completely. What was missing? We did not have a framework or one that would provide a blueprint for doing research. One that would help us understand by way of development theories what we were doing and how well all the variables and concepts that we were investigating were related to one another. Where are we going? What would be the expected result of the research? Therefore, Theories and research are codependent and interdependent. They are married. They cannot be divorced. Later, when I went back to the academe, I found out that this is true. When I was armed with practice and rich research experiences, I did not have theories and frameworks on which to anchor my studies. In communicating to people, organizing groups, and conducting various training, I needed a framework that would integrate all of this and make sense out of the experience. I needed guides and parameters for conducting research. Theories make you predict outcomes, teach you what to observe. They can be springboards for further learning and discoveries. As a researcher, I applied these theories as analytical tools. That is how important theories are. So when I took my MA and PhD and started to teach at the University of the Philippines, I became more enamored with theories, and in fact, I taught a few courses on theories. I was amazed at how fluid are theories. They are never constant, dynamic, and ever changing. Theories have a life, evolving, maybe innovated or customized. They are very flexible. They made me understand better the knowledge, attitude, and feelings of people. My third journey, and my third point as well, 
Being in a graduate school, which is all about theory and research, further honed my research skills. I learned that good research is only as good as a research plan or a research proposal. We cannot just gather data and start entering a community and asking questions without planning. We cannot just shoot from the hips or ask any questions without understanding the relevance and relation of that question to the objective of the research. You have to plan every details of the research. A good research drafts a complete and comprehensive plan. First, it is essential that you must have a good and interesting topic, a sign of the times, a social issue, an untrodden subject, or an organizational concern. For research being an art, you should have a catchy title, one that will make your readers imagine and be baffled and bewitched, bothered and bewildered, and therefore continue reading your work. And then you have to transform the title into a good research problem and capture the essence of the research into smart objectives and further unpack the measures and indicators to better understand what is it that you want to study. Variables and concepts are reduced to bits, behavioral, even numerical, specific, clear, understandable, and terms are defined so as not to invite further questions. Next, I sort of demonized the review of literature in my story about doing research inside Camp Karame. But this time, I will elevate its importance as a vital part of any research. You just don't do undertake research without knowing what has been written about it. You need to be guided by what uh, scholars have discovered about the topic. Do not fall into the trap of redundancy. Draw inspiration from earlier works. Look for the research gaps. Because this gap is the one that will heighten the interest and credibility of your study. But do not use the literature as feelers to thicken the pages of your research. That is why the word related is there to make sure that the literature has relevance to your research topic. The literature is good in fine-tuning your research problems and objectives. I have pretty much mentioned the importance of being guided by theories and framework, but one last point I would like to stress about this is that you should be creative by graphically or visually presenting your frameworks. Arrows, double-headed arrows, broken lines, solid lines, squares, circles, rectangles, triangles, and all shapes and sizes are available for you to symbolize relationships, movements, and plan. It would be good to also operationalize the variables and concepts by applying this in your chosen study. Next point, on research design and methods, what will we use when you want to look into the depth and breadth of a phenomenon? Your method should match your objectives. If it is generalization you want and would like to know the situation of a large number of people, then the quantitative methods would be your friend. If you want deep insights and explore context, the qualitative methods would be the methods to meet your objectives. But of course, we encourage that combination of methods and approaches will be most important. Triangulate, as I said earlier. One of the most difficult parts of doing research is finding your respondents or informants. While you may have identified them, scheduling the interview would be challenging. So a good researcher is creative and should not stop at anything to meet the research participants. I will cite an example of a difficult situation of scheduling an interview with working informants. When I was doing a research among the sacadas or sugar workers in Bacolod, sugar cane workers in Bacolod, whenever I went to the bunkers or to their houses, they were always out in the sugar cane fields. And for a couple of times, they were not around. I was not successful in meeting them in their shelters or dugouts. I had to wait for weekends where I thought they would be home to rest. To my dismay, they were still out in the sugarcane fields, toiling and trying to finish and hauling the canes in the wagons for delivery in the milling center. Who oh, no. I could go. It could not go on this way. My research plan would be derailed. So 
So what do you think I did? I went to the sugarcane fields and joined them in the wagons and some in the milling center. My approach was not an interview, but a storytelling event. This implied that I should be familiar with my interview guide and just ask the appropriate questions and follow-ups depending on what they were telling me. I grabbed the opportunity to ask questions during their breaks while they were resting. So the research plan should have everything. Oh, how you will conduct the surveys, FGDs, key informant interviews, ocular inspection, participant observation, and participatory research. This requires familiarity with the various research methods, their nature, where these are applied appropriately, how these are conducted, their advantages and disadvantages, the tools or instruments and the issues or challenges that may arise when conducting them. What are the other items that should complete the research proposal? The sampling scheme, how this is done, the number of respondents, the venue of the research, the research team composition and their roles and responsibilities. For the research plan to be neatly laid out, use matrices, graphs, and other clear visuals. Define terms and responsibilities and relationships. A Gantt chart, I'm sure you're familiar with a Gantt chart, will always be useful. Of course, more important is your budget. Provide the details of your expenses and rationalize this. Did you notice? I sort of was rushing to present the research plan and missed on out on some details, which you can read in that book. So I did not repeat the contents of that book. You have to buy it outside. <laughs> I might run out of time and overlook the most important message I want to make in developing quality research. What is this? Ethics. A quality research is ethical. How? You know, there is now a growing awareness of and concern for ethical standards in human participant research. Researchers should know how to apply basic ethics principles in their research. We should read and pay particular attention to data privacy principles in consideration of the Data Privacy Act. Why? Because researchers deal with people and society. Researchers are mainly concerned with issues related to social context and relationships. There are cases of exploitative, extractive research practices adversely affecting respondents and informants. Also, technological advancements, advancements have rendered individuals more prone to fake news, cyberbullying, breach of data privacy rules and regulations. But we note that there are movements to protect human rights. There are advocacy programs and activities for accountability and participation. Universities, academic institutions conduct campaigns and require compliance with ethical standards, codes, and laws. Funding institutions, multilateral aid and donors, oblige proponents, researchers to secure ethics clearance. Moreover, publishers demand that submitted papers or articles have passed through a review process. The Philippine Data Privacy Act is now enforced, and, there are, and therefore, for us to be good and ethical researchers, there are some guiding principles that we should uphold. I know that our next speaker will be talking about ethical research, but I would just like to give my take on this. So what are these guiding principles? How many minutes do you have? Uh, can I discuss this one by one? So we have integrity, confidentiality, anonymity and privacy, informed consent, beneficent social justice, cultural and gender sensitivity, and protection of the vulnerable population. Uh, integrity. What do I mean by integrity? I will cite an experience, you know, because researchers should be committed to present accurate findings they should be intellectually honest and truthful they do not plagiarize it is a crime in the university when i was a professor in research you know my department had actually uh, submitted several cases of plagiarism to students and these students are even running for honors but they were 
Uh, they, uh, they were not given these honors because they committed plagiarism. How did they commit plagiarism? You know, when you work as a group, you divide the parts of the research and then ask your member to do this. No. The one who did the review of related literature copied and pasted the contents of that chapter. So what happened? Well, we noticed that she plagiarized and so we actually filed a case against the whole team. And the whole team was surprised, Mom, but we were not part of the review of related literature. We did just the, you know, the findings, the problem, and the other parts, but not the review of related literature. So we were not part of that, no? But we said, this is a group work, therefore everyone should be uh, responsible for this. So uh, the whole members of the team were suspended. Another case. There was this graduate student who submitted the paper, but was so uh, careless, you know. She, she was a teacher, and what she did was just to get a paper from her students and submitted it as hers. But she was not careful. She was not able to replace the word we, ours, no? into I or mine. So, we detected that it was not hers, and she admitted it, and she was dismissed, okay? So, integrity means also that uh, you should be uh, qualified to do research. You, have, you should have knowledge, training, and experience, and the proper orientation. You should display scholarly rigor in data collection, analysis of data, and in reporting and publishing the results of your research. Rigor means no shortcuts, but go through the process I have shown earlier. Follow the steps. Follow your research plan. Research is logical, methodical, question-oriented, cumulative, and creative. A good researcher's analysis of the findings are not slanted towards predetermined outcomes to favor researchers, their institution, the sector, or sponsor. I had this research with an institution. It is an NGO. This NGO is dependent on a funder. Okay, so the funder asked us to evaluate the program because the second year funding will be dependent on the program. But the result of the evaluation was poor. The objectives were not met, and therefore we had to write it. You know, the NGO came to us pleading, please, please sanitize your report, because if you submit it as is, we will not be given a second year funding. So what will you do as a researcher? The request was to sanitize the report, meaning show that it was not a failure. And we were not yet paid. <laughs> so would we agree so that we can get the last tranche of our payment? Of course we did not. We have to be we have to have this integrity with us. So we did not we did not agree to sanitize the report. You know what they did? Well we gave the report. They asked for a doc document. I don't know. Maybe they edited it. But we told them, remove our names there. If you will sanitize this and, you know, do something about it, revise it, please remove our names. We have nothing to do with that research if you present it differently from how we found the research to be. So integrity is not only for the researcher, but the data and documents should be against fabrication, distortion hiding or destruction. This suggests that we should keep away from projects that serve the researcher's economic, political, or institutional self-interest. We should be transparent in our source of funding. We have to divulge who is funding the research. Where, the research, where are the research money coming from? From government? From politicians? From interest groups? From PubCorp? from TV networks like APS-CBN and GMA7 so that both will have number one rating. So we should disclose those. Next, we should watch out for potential misuse of findings by third parties. I remember that my department conducted a research regarding the winability of presidential votes during an election period. 
The results were presented in a forum for academic purposes. The results showed the winningest candidate. To our surprise, this candidate who ranked number one in our research approached us and wanted to buy the data at any cost. You can surmise why he will use it in his campaign to proudly say that UP study showed him being ranked as number one. He will use the data for propaganda purposes and campaign materials. The price of the data was tempting, but of course we did not agree. We were reminded of the word integrity. So moving on, let us talk about confidentiality, anonymity, and privacy. This involves a relationship of trust between the researcher and participants and needs careful and protective handling of information as well. Identity uh, being revealed only if permission was granted or obtained. We should take note that our participants have the right to privacy, freedom from unwanted observation, disturbance, and interference. They can say no to recordings, observation, or even the interview. Their personal and private information should be confidential. Prior to the interview, information on how data will be collected, safeguarded, and who may use them should be revealed. Okay. An informed consent should be obtained. Why informed and not just consent? Because it is not enough that the research participant agrees to the interview. He or she should be told about the nature, rational procedures of the study, the nature of his or his her involvement, potential risks, consequences, and benefits of participation. Participants should give full information without coercion and undue influence. We should ask permission if we want to record the interview, videotape it, or take pictures. What about beneficence? It is doing good and doing no harm. The research should be able to enhance the well-being and improve the situation of participants rather than undermine or endanger them. If risk outweighs the benefits, alternative approaches must be sought. We now move to social justice. This is the right of individuals and communities to participate freely in producing knowledge and having access to information relevant to their well-being. Vulnerable and marginalized groups must have a fair chance to produce knowledge just like community gatekeepers and other power holders. For cultural and gender sensitivity, researchers must avoid exacerbating inequalities and inequities such as gender, ethnic class, and other forms of discrimination. And how do we do this? We must use culture-sensitive and gender-sensitive language like chair or marginalizing new women by using his, him instead of hers or including them. Uh, as pronouns that are gender fair and non-exclusive. Avoid stereotype biases and prejudices and forms of othering, like the LGBTQ. <laughs> no other group should be inequitably burdened with risks in research. Last point, researchers should protect the vulnerable population. Vulnerable groups include children and minors, Pregnant women, older persons, persons with little or no education, persons with disabilities, either physical or mental, young or old, poor, or those with marginalized status, survivors of disaster, violence, and abuse, crimes, disasters, and other difficult circumstances. Special safeguards must be accorded to research participants whose capability to decide is reduced and who occupy the lower echelons of our society. Conclusion, so I'm now coming to the end. To conclude, developing quality researchers is a protracted, conscious, you know, you have to plan for it, conscious and a challenging effort. It requires creativity. So it is both science and art. It requires creativity, patience in following the rigors and steps in doing research. You have to practice it continuously. It's not enough that you do one research and then you can say, I'm doing quality research. You have to make mistakes. 
repeatedly do it but improving along the way you have to practice continuously and the practice should get better and better in its experience you have to read and learn from experts good research requires due diligence and critical thinking understanding your research participants and most of all be ethical in conducting research thank you very much and good morning to everyone Thank you very much, Dr. Lourdes M. Portus, the Executive Director of the Philippine Social Science Council. How about a big hand to our first plenary speaker? That was indeed a very informative discussion about developing quality research. And at this point in time, we, will, we would like to acknowledge our partner organizations in organizing this prestigious event. We have the Philippine Communication Society, the Philippine Higher Education Researchers Consortium, our partner institution, the Taguig City University, and Technological University of the Philippines, and the Rizal Technological University. We are also inviting everyone to be part of the Opcor Philippines, so those who are not yet a member of this organization, kindly approach our registration area for you to become a member. And you can use this, syempre, sa ating NPC. Sayang naman po ito. No? This is a once in a lot of opportunity. And uh, at the same time, we would like to also acknowledge our sponsors for uh, this event. We have the Gardenia Corporation and Energen. So you have to reserve now your questions for our open forum later. Yeah, if you have some questions, just write it down now so you could easily approach the mic that will be provided there in front of you or in, in the hall. Okay. Also, okay. So we are also inviting everyone to uh, turn on your FB page. We are live uh, in FB. Uh, the uh, link is uh, AppCore. Dot official. So uh, you invite your friends to watch us and uh, learn more about the conference and different topics that we have right now. And uh, kindly use the hashtag 2019 Accor. Yan po. Para po ma-acknowledge po yung mga uh, nakakalive po ngayon. At mabilang po sa ating mga streamers and watchers. And we would also like to acknowledge the presence of our officials right now who are with us. We have the uh, chairman of APCOR, Aldo Carey International University, Professor Ear, Dr. Nud Jailane Bin Mod Noor. We also have the executive director of APCOR, Dr. Witawat Zhang Yam from Burafa University, Thailand. We also have the President of the Rizal Technological University, Dr. Maria Eugenia M. Yampo. The President of the Geek City University, Dr. Juan C. Birion, represented by his Chief of Staff, Office of the President, TCU, Dr. Amalia C. Rosales. The uh, President of Technological University of the Philippines, Dr. Jesus Rodrigo Torres, represented by Dr. Aira Valenzuela, the Director of Research. From Sultan Idris Education University, Malaysia, Dr. Haniza Hani Mudzain, the Director of the Research Coordination Office and Founder of uh, the Wow Bali Global Initiatives Bali, Indonesia, Dr. Hai Dai Nguyen. And also we have a research partner from Walailat University, Thailand, Dr. Vina Root. Nisa Patuorn. So those are our guests from our neighboring countries and we would like to thank them all for gracing our occasion.
Once again, ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause to our keynote speaker, Honorable Joel Villanueva.